Hello, welcome. Oh, goodness, this is loud, isn't it? Hey, uh, I'm Jim, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about my life as a tugboat captain. Thank you all for coming. This is a fun time for me. Uh, many of you guys know my father, he's here, and I uh, really, really enjoy uh, everything here at Park Danforth. But uh, today we wanted to talk about tugboats, but before we get there, I wanted to tell you that um, this is a really cheap plug on my part, but uh, I have two YouTube channels. I, uh, one is a tugboat channel that we, it's a maritime education channel, and it's to be at sea, and anybody that's interested, I have a bunch of cards that I can give out to you guys, if you, if you guys are interested in the, uh, <laughs> now here somewhere, but anyway, You're we can set up with that. And I also have a very small sailing channel, so that if any of you guys are interested in the maritime stuff beyond tuck boats and uh, are interested in me, my better half, looking to sail around the world, or at least oh, next year heading to the Azores, and from the Azores we go to Gibraltar, and then we'll spend six months in the Mediterranean. If you'd like to come along virtually, we'd love to have you. All right, so let's get going. So a little bit of background on me. Um, I grew up on Monhegan Island, and if those of you that aren't familiar with Monhegan, Monhegan's an uh, island about 12 miles off of uh, Port Clyde, 16 miles off of Booth Bay, about 33 miles down from Morocco. And uh, we grew up over there. And then, this is a little picture that I thought would be fun to put, I mean, getting my Marlin Spike skills down at a young age. But anyway, um, I actually went to the University of Maine in Orono and was a comp sci major. I was uh, studying computer science. And uh, it's funny, I just found out, I just the Uber driver that brought me from the airport to the rental car place when I came up here to see dad told me that they no longer say UMO. Did you guys know this? No. I, I didn't know this either. That it's just that Orono is just humane now. <laughs> and I said, well, what about the universe of Southern Maine? So, oh, that's Southern Maine. <laughs> so, no. I, anyway, I didn't get that in the alumni newspaper. <laughs> anyway, I moved to Rhode Island and uh, actually started fishing with my brother in the commercial fishing fleet in Point Judith, Rhode Island. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, a lot of us that have spent our life on the water, um, sometimes we try to get away from it a while, but after a while, the, the, the ocean has a way of calling you back. So years after a career in sail, uh, sales, I ended up going to work for the DOD or a, a project with what they call the, the Department of Defense, where some friends of mine had this boat that was originally the research vessel Argo Maine, which was uh, uh, originally belonged to uh, Maine Maritime Academy. And some of their alums, one of them who also grew up on, on the Hagen with me, um, had bought this and they were doing research charters for the Department of Defense. And this is where they do a lot of uh, uh, research and gathering data, data acquisition for projects in the future. And so we were working on something called a digital, a multi-element digital phased array, which is a big fancy antenna for submarines. So I did that and I said, you know what, sales isn't for me. And I wanted to go back to, to, the, to the ocean. And to be quite frank, my time as a commercial fisherman, wasn't the best time I'd ever had. Um, it wasn't, I wasn't really surrounded by the people that I really wanted to be surrounded mm -hmm. by. And then I trying on the Argo Maine, I was surrounded by scientists and people that, and, and professional mariners who held licenses and had to have drug tests and these sorts of things. And uh, well, I said, those are the people that I really wanted to surround myself with. And uh, so going back to sea, I decided I wanted to go back in a more professional uh, environment. And so because I didn't go to a maritime school, and because I was uh, basically starting with nothing, I started out as what they call an OS, which is an ordinary seaman, which is kind of a nice way of saying the bottom, <laughs> bottom of the barrels. So I started way down there, and I started for a company that was in Connecticut, and it was a just by chance, it was a great company to work for, because they did a lot of men, almost all the different types of towing there are, and we'll talk about those different types as we go on, but they did it all, and so it was a really good place for me to start. And um, as time went by, I came up through what they call coming up through the horse pipe. And the horse pipe is something that there's two basic routes to the wheels ups. The quickest, the fastest, the most cost effective way would be to go to a maritime school. The other way 
is the way that I didn't choose. It just happened for me. And that's where you start at the bottom and work your way through all the positions to get to the top. And it takes a long time. And there's, because we can't, right. you, you don't, you, you don't, you're not just made a tough boat captain. Right. You have to have, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of continuing education right. and the licenses we get are stepped. So you can't just go to a big license. You have to start a little, spend some time in that, move to the next and that sort of stuff. So the horse pipe is actually the pipe or the hole in the bow of a ship. And it's where the, where the, the anchor chain goes down, or the, what's called the anchor road, goes down to the anchor and comes all the way up on deck. And so the old sailing ships, people say, how did you get in the wheelhouse? Well, like climbed up the horse plane. So that's why they say that I came up through the horse plane. Anyway, presently I am the master, or what's also known as the captain of an ocean-going tug called the Anacostia. Um, I just spent the last almost three years delivering all the fuel to the power plants in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And now I'm working, we just brought the, the boat back and uh, we're, we've been working in the Gulf of Mexico and we don't really know where we're going after, we, after now. So who knows what happens. But mm -hmm. anyway, so um, this is a, a fun little aerial shot we did of us anchored in Puerto Rico. But to give you an idea of tug operations, uh, it's traditional for a, a tug this size to have a crew of five, and that would be a captain, a mate, an engineer, an AB, and an OS. Uh, the AB would be the able bodied seaman, and the OS would be the ordinary seaman. They're both fancy names for deckhands. And uh, the, the, because we have 24 hour operations, the, the boat has to, has to be manned all the time. And obviously, the captain can't stand all those watches. So the boat is basically split in half between two watches there's the captain's watch and the mate's watch. And the captain will have a deck hand, and usually the engineer, and then the end of the mate will have a, the other deck hand. And the engineer, if something goes wrong, he doesn't really stand to watch. He usually stays on the captain's watch just because the captain's a great guy to hang out with. This is where you guys are supposed to nod and agree. <laughs> um, but but uh, the, the, we are regulated just like airline pilots. Those of us in the wheelhouse can only spend 12 hours a day, 12 and 24 hours actually working. Um, but that doesn't, that's not the case for the engineers. The engineers, if something goes wrong, they have to work 36 hours straight. They have to do whatever they have to do to fix the problem. They are not constrained by what happens. So, so basically what happens is the captain has the, the boat. In other words, he's, he's in command of everything from six in the morning till noon. And then from six at night till midnight where the mate, it, the captain goes to bed and the mate takes over and he's in command from from midnight to six in the morning and from noon until six at night. Now, mm -hmm. I didn't put it in the slide, but a lot of people say, well, if there's a problem, what happens? And, you know, there's many benefits to having rank, but the, one, of the, one of the bad things about it is that ultimately the captain, even when I'm off watch and I'm sleeping in my bunk, if my mate has a terrible oil spill, I too will have to suffer the consequences of that because I allowed him to cover for me. But that's just that. Anyway, we work a rotation or what we call a hitch. Um, we, the, 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 the industry is very good about this. There's some places down south that used to do different ways, but predominantly in the industry, we work what we call equal time. Um, boats that work for like around New York Harbor and Portland and that sort of things, they usually work a two week uh, called two and two. So they work, work for two weeks and then they have two weeks off. Um, those of us that tow up and down with, you know, offshore, we can't always crew change on the time that we'd like to. So sometimes if we're coming across the Gulf of Mexico and crew changes on Wednesday and we leave on Tuesday morning, we might not get in to to a place that can crew change just until Friday or Saturday. So we need a we need a little bit more time to be flexible. So we usually work a three and three mm -hmm. schedule. So we right now I'm at the end of my three weeks. I've been here with dad. So uh, pretty soon I will go back to work. Now mm -hmm. to layout. This is this is kind of funny. Um I was on the fence whether I should include the slide or not, but um I thought that it would be fun because it's not just tugboats, but many things in the maritime world have their own nomenclature. We uh, we have almost a different language that we speak on the boat for different things, and so there are a bunch of things. I'm wondering if I move this, can you guys see my 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 mouse yeah. moving on the screen? All right, good, good, good. Okay. So anyway, we have this. There are things that on the boat that we call shivs, and if you wonder what a shiv is, this right here is a shiv. This is a shiv. This is a shiv. And this is a shiv. And what they do is that 
eventually when we put this boat in push here, and you'll see that later on, there'll be a wire that comes to here and splits into two different lengths and goes around the ship, comes around here and goes up this way, and another one comes around the ship and goes up this way. And so it makes so that, that whether it's a soft line or a hard wire, it can go around a corner without kinking. So anyway, funny name for a ship. Another thing is a Texas bar. And although some of you might think this was a place to get a libation in Texas, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> this right here is, oops, there you go. This right here is the Texas bar, and it goes across the stern. And there are also these things right here and right here. And you'll, you're going to see video of this in action. These are what we call the donuts. And what happened, this, I get on my YouTube channel, a lot of people ask me questions. They'll say, why is it called the Texas bar? And I can only guess at this, and uh, I, I, I think my guess is probably right. I haven't heard anybody tell me otherwise. But I think that there was a problem that the first people that started to solve this problem were in Texas. They started putting this bar on to fix the problem, and we called it a Texas bar. So anyway, what happens is when we're towing a barge, here's the winch right here. The wire will cross, go over one of these things, and go over the back of the stern rail right here. Now, if this bar wasn't there, it would go straight across there and it would rub on the stern rail. And it would we would prefer it to eat to wear away at the rail of the stern because if it eats away at the wire, we'll lose the tow. And and so, but in a perfect world, it wouldn't wear at all. And that's where they go and they put this big bar up with this roller and it keeps everything off the back and keeps the the uh chain from happening. So that's what a Texas bar is. Then obviously mm. we have the winch here. The next thing is the fiddly. Does anyone know what a fiddly is? That's, I didn't know it was until I got on a tugboat as well. <laughs> anyway, the fiddly is just tugboat speak for the upper engine room. So this area right here would be, and, and it's, oh, oh, every tugboat that I've worked on has a fiddly and every fiddly has a great so you're standing on like one inch grate that goes across. And the reason is that they, they move a lot of air through the engine room. So they can't seal this off as a solid floor. So this whole area is such that the fans and everything can move all that through. So this area is called the fiddly. Like I say, probably doesn't impact your life that much, but now you know a new word. <laughs> all right, so this is the galley right here. And you'll see pictures of our galley. We've got a beautiful galley. And, you know, some of our boats even have marble and granite countertops. It's uh, they're really nice. Something that distinguishes us, and it's not just our boats, but I think you know every time I've ever worked on is that this area over here, which will have the the, the galley table and it'll have the TV there, and uh, you know it's where people kind of hang out. On a yacht, you would normally call this the salon, or depending on which side of the Atlantic on you're on, you might call it the saloon. But in the Togo world, this whole area is a, is called the galley. And if you don't do your work and you hang out here watching TV, it'd be called a galley rat. So that's what that's all about. So up here, up in the uh, corner up here, you'll see this is the, the deckhands room where the AP and the OS stay. And they have um, upper and lower berths here and they share a room. But because of the watch schedule, they're never in the room at the same time. And the industry is changing as many things are changing in, in the world today. And we're having more and more women that are working on tugboats. And we don't really have a need at this point to have segregated bathrooms or segregated living quarters. So when women come in, they start at the bottom just like we do. And when they work, you know, in, when they share a room, they might share a room with a man, but the two of them are never in the, in the room at the same time. Because while one is in the room sleeping, the other is outside of the room working. And then vice versa, you know, switches off. And then there's the lower head, which is, you know, the, the bathroom down here. And uh, these are um, very similar. It doesn't look very different. It looks into, to, probably doesn't look too much different than the, the bathroom you guys have in your apartment here at Park Danforth. Uh, beautiful shower, all that sort of stuff. And then we have the engineer's quarters right here. And the engineer will have an extra bunk just in case we have to bring somebody on if they're training. Or there are times that we have to bring the crew of the barge with us. It doesn't happen that often, but um, we have what we call ocean class barges. In other words, they have all the safety equipment for them to go out in the ocean. But every one of our trips is governed not so much by company policy, but more by the insurance binder for that particular thing. And the way that it's kind of weird, but 
we move oil, but we don't move our oil. We'll move oil for an oil company. And then that oil company will say, we don't want you going in this weather. We don't want people on the barge to be going around a Hatteras during during uh, hurricane season, that sort of thing. And so when they when they when they dictate those things, we need room. So we have an extra bed in the engineer's room. And then over here we have the mate's room over here, and he has two beds as well. So the, the mate will have a, a spot and there's an extra bed there for either a trainee or for uh, the two, you know, we can put the two uh Tankerman on board if we have to. If you go up to that, would, we call that the OO deck or the, the deck that was on the water line. This is what we call the O1 deck or the stack deck because the exhaust stacks come out right here. And this is the captain's quarters right here. He has a nice room. I don't know the benefits of rank, <laughs> but if you come across here and you look down here, there's a uh, this is the stairwell that goes right down in the galley and then continues right up into the wheelhouse over here. And there's a head here. And it's it kind of looks on paper like it's set up like it's the captain's head. But because there's five of us on the boat and sometimes seven, and there's really one head down below, we I, I haven't worked for any captains that said this is my head. We can all use it if we say you have to use the bathroom and the other one's taken, you're all set. But anyway, then the next thing is um the wheel ups. So we have two wheelhouses, and not all tugboats do this. If you're a tug that is primarily engaged in what we call ship assist, those would be the tugs that you see in harbors that help ships get to the dock. They usually don't need an upper wheelhouse, and an upper wheelhouse will actually hurt them because of the what we call the rake of the ship. And that's where the bow comes up and flares out like that. When they if they get in underneath there the flare of the ship can actually come in contact with the upper wheelhouse. But if you're moving barges, and in our case, our barge comes up almost 22 to 25 feet out of the water when it's empty. So when it's loaded, you could see everything from our, our lower wheelhouse when you're pushing behind it. But when you discharge it, the barge grows by 25 feet and you're just looking at a wall of steel. So you need to have something. And in this case, I think the height of I and our, at, at, or, or, at, the lower house, I think it's like, I want to say like 20 feet or something like that. So we're like 18 to 20 feet off the water in the lower house. But then we have an upper house of ours, and it's a small version of the lower house, but it's up on top and it has a height of, I think, like 68 feet. So it's much higher up. So we can look over the top of the barge that we're either in push gear or alongside. And if, if you're wondering what does push gear alongside mean, I, 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 we're going to get to that soon enough. But some of the things that make these the upper wheel have special is you have a ladder and uh, the ladder will come up on the side and you see that there's usually a way to get all the way around 360 degrees of the wheelhouse because if you're 60 feet in the air, you wouldn't think so, but towing offshore, you get a lot of salt spray that gets on the windows. And although during the day you can see stuff, as soon as you try to look at something at night, you can't see anything. So it's imperative that you're able to get that salt spray off of there uh, have to be, you know, so that it doesn't impede your visibility later on. But um, then when you get inside, there's something called the tube, and this is a, a ladder. So then when you come in, you come in through a door right here, and there's a door that goes here and a ladder that goes all the way down. And this is really an emergency egress. So if something were to go wrong, you could still go up or down this without having to go outside for one reason or another. And then we have the upper helm, and you know this is basically a smaller version or more I shouldn't say smaller because it's it's got all the same capabilities as the helm down below it's just a lot more compact and instead of having a group of people in the wheelhouse that might be hanging out on watch with me in the lower house it's just one person up here or unless we bring a pilot with us and it's just the two of us there now when we go down below and this is from the water line down um, I hope that, I hope I'm not boring you. Is this is are we too technical or is this is this okay? You guys are okay with this? No, okay, good. Good. So so most of the tugboats you don't see because um, we draw about 14 or 15 feet of water, and so that means that that's how much water we need to float. Most of everything that you're looking at is way below the waterline, and um, we'll get into that for a second. But you can see right over here we have the two main engines. And if you do, if you do what we call, we call it pushing red flag. That means that we have to have a red flag indicating that we are moving hazardous material. And in our case, that would be controlling products. 
So if you're going to do anything with a red flag on it, you have to have redundancy, at least in the magnitude of two, if not more. So everything that we have, we have two engines, we have two generators, we have two steering systems, we have two water pumps, we have two air. Every, everything is on two, two air compressors, two radars, everything is it. So if, um, obviously, if you, you can't guard for every possible thing, but as long as, you know, the odds of something going bad are quite good, the odds of two things going bad at the same time are much less. So that's what we're, we try to mitigate those problems. But anyway, the company that I work for has uh, primarily two models of tugboats. They, they look very similar. One's just a little bit bigger, but they have a much different horsepower. Our, the models are a 3000 and a 4200. They're both based on, on horsepower. So they Almost all the newer tugboats today, and there are a lot of tugboats that are still working that might be 20, 30, 50, 60 years old, because they, they, they just run for a long time. Um, many of those are moving red flag because a lot of the oil, uh, the people that want to hire us to move their product don't want the liability of an older, less reliable engine as, the, as opposed to something that might be newer with more safety features on it. So in our case, or I should say our case, in New York Harbor, where we have the most amount of tugboats per area, um, anywhere in the United States, uh, the predominant engine are Caterpillars right now, and it's a 35 series engine. Our 3000 have the 12 cylinder ones, so they call that a 3512, and our 4200 horsepower uh, models have the 3516s. And oddly enough, these engines are capable of much, much more power. They can they can almost double that power, but it come you know like if you had a yacht and you wanted to go really fast for 20 minutes and then stop, you could make the, you could tune these engines up to really dump almost twice that power. But if you wanted to be a tugboat that was running at 100% load for 20 or 30 years, you would need to detune the engine, and that's what we have here. So our two classes are 3,000 and 4,200 horsepower. Then we have two generators, and they're usually about 99 kW. And then the tankage code, which, and the reason why we have a lot of tanks is, or a lot of tank inch, how much fuel we hold on board, is because with the power and the size that we are, we would be like a little roller ski if we didn't have a lot of water or fuel on the boat. In other words, all that power would go out and it would just kind of move around the ocean. It would be very hard to control. By adding thousands and thousands of, of, of gallons of fuel and water, the boat sinks and it becomes more heavy and more secure and you tow in a straighter line that way. So the R3000s hold about 55 thousand gallons of diesel fuel and our 4200s hold about nine ninety thousand gallons of diesel fuel and so once again that that's predominantly for uh adding weight so that that you can control the tone better um but there is a fun rule of uh, this a rule of thumb for what they call these medium speed diesels is that if you want to know how much your fuel consumption is they say that these type of engines for if you run at 100% load, but in other words, they're pulling a loaded barge um, and uh, you should burn one gallon per horsepower per 24 hour period. And in the case of our 4200s, we run about 80% load. We don't always run a 100% load and we still burn about 4,000 gallons of fuel every day. So it's a big bill when you get to the fuel station. So that's why we have to have a lot of tankage. But we also carry 2,500 gallons of water for the 3,000s and the 4,200s carry 9,000 gallons of water. And those of the offshore towing boats like the 4,200 that I'm on um, that go to places like Puerto Rico and other places that not everywhere is set up to get where you can get water. You can go to a lot of ports and they just don't have water available for you. Or they have fire mains, but they're not potable water. So um, for those boats like ours, we have a water maker too. And a water maker, um, we use, uh, it, it, it's not through distillation, it's actually through reverse osmosis where they get seawater and they pressurize it to 800 pounds per square inch and pass it through a membrane that is so tight it, it, it actually strips the salt off of the water molecules and you're left with fresh water. And uh, 
we can do that and produce about 40 to 60 gallons per hour with our water maker. Mm. All right, so let's talk about tow configurations. So this is towing or on the wire, some people call it towing astern. This is when you think of a tugboat towing a barge, the tugs out in front, and it's a long wire. And there's a barge years ago, this long wire used to be a, uh, a hawser. The hawser would be a big floating, or hopefully floating, manila line at one time, and then it went to nylon and went to a whole bunch of other things. And uh, they were really difficult to manhandle and uh, really determine the size of how much you, how, how big a barge you could tow, regardless of the horsepower you had. You didn't have a connection that, that you could make a huge rope, but you wouldn't have men strong enough to be able to coil it on the deck, in the deck. Well, when they started using uh, wire rope, which is great big cables, and these are cables like you find like on a crane somewhere, they look very similar, but these are specifically made for the marine environment and they have uh, anti-corrosive uh, corrosion properties to them and that sort of stuff. And in our case, I think we have a two and a half inch wire, so it's about this big around. And we, uh, we, we tow with it. And if you say, why do we do that as opposed to doing other things? There's some things that you can do when you're towing that you can't in other configurations. One of them is that we're not really limited by weather constraints. We don't want to be out in bad weather. We don't want to be out there when there's a hurricane or anything like that. But if there is something bad like that, or you know, or even if it's just uncomfortable times, it would be far too rough for us to be alongside the barge or in push gear. So we have to tow. And the reason why we can tow is we use the weight of the wire to act as a shock absorber. And we do this because remember that big wire, if we put 1,200 feet of wire out there, um, we might have three, four tons of wire between the tug and the tow. And so if we both stop, the weight of the wire would draw the two of them together eventually. But the idea is that that weight of that wire acts as a shock absorber and goes up and down through the water column, absorbing the discrepancies in energy. And what, what Maybe a better way to describe this is if you think of the ocean, whether you have one a one foot sea or a 20 foot sea, it's basically a sine wave going like this, right? And so that's fine if you guys are perfectly lined up. The problem is that sine wave is constantly changing. It's getting bigger and faster and smaller and slower and all that sort of stuff. So if the tugboat were approaching the, the, the beginning of the wave, it would be essentially going uphill. And so that would slow the tugboat down. Now, if at the same time, if the barge was at the crest of the wave and started sliding down the hill, it would be accelerating. So the tugboat slows down and the barge accelerates. The distance between the two shrinks and the wire or the cantonary, the bend of the wire, becomes more elongated and the two come together. That's not the worst problem, especially because if we have, if, if we're in deep, deep water and we don't then run the risk of having the wire touch the bottom, Everything's fine with that. The problem is exactly the opposite. If the bar, if the tug was on top of the crest of the wave and it was coming down, so now the tug is accelerating and the barge is at the bottom of the wave and it's going up the hill and it's going to decelerate. So now what happens is the distance between the two grows really quickly. And if you didn't have enough wire, the wire would come up and there's a shock load that would be so great it would rip everything off the deck. And um, one of the one of the ways we'd like to uh, describe this, and I, I wish this was my theory for this, is Captain Irving Johnson, who's a legend in the sailing world, came up with this. I thought it was brilliant. He said, if you think about a piece of oak and a nail and a hammer, if you put the nail on the oak and you put the hammer against the nail, the strongest man on the planet would not be able to force that nail in there. But anybody can get that hammer, swing it, and hit the nail, and it will go into the wood. And that's kind of the difference between towing on the wire and having that shock load come up and hit it. So the, the, the stresses on the wire and all the equipment, when that wire comes tight, are just mind-blowing. And, uh, and so the way, we, the way we deal with that, with mitigating that stress, is by putting more and more wire out, which adds more and more weight than the cantonary will go up and down through the water column. And that's why we tow. And so that's really good. There are, are some problems. <laughs> the, one of the problems is, I don't know if you guys have figured this out yet, 
we're not really connected to it other than pulling it. There's no engines other than generators and pumps. There are, there, there are no, no propulsion motors on the barge. So we have no way of stopping this. And in case of my barge, oops, we went back too far, sorry. In the case of my barge, we hold about 2.4 million gallons of product. And the barge itself, I think, weighs like 5,600 tons empty, plus all of the stuff. So you have a tremendous amount, probably 12,000 long tons of kinetic energy that might be moving at seven knots. When I stop towing, that thing will keep going for many, many miles. And the only thing that's going to slow that down is the drag or the resistance of it going through the water or the, through the air, like the wind blowing against it. So that's a real problem. And uh, when you see people towing a big barge in a tight waterway like Portland Harbor, that guy is either really good or really stupid. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I say that they're, they're, nobody does that. There aren't stupid people to do that because it, it's terrifying. But that's one of the biggest problems that you have with it. Um, another thing that you like about doing this, other than that you can go to the weather, is that you're, the more wire you put out, the better speed you can make. And if you look at this picture, see in the back of the tongue, see all that white water? We call that quick water, or some people call that wheel wash. If you don't have, if it's not rough and you have the wire really short, that energy will end up going and hitting the bow of, of, of what you're towing. And so that, that slows you down as well. So the longer you stretch it out, the more energy you have going in the straight wind. And you see this right here, you can see this is the broken water right here from the tugboat and the barge is going up the middle. And so what that really means is that you have broken water in, oops, sorry, I keep hitting wrong um, In the, it's only as wide as one vessel, even though they're two, but because they're in line, you can make it. You can make good speed that way. You just can't slow down very much. All right. Then the next thing is what we call towing alongside, or some people call it on the hip. And um, this is something that has advantages, like we were saying before, because you're made up alongside it, and you do it with a three part makeup so that the, now the, the tugboat is actually part of the unit. Um, you can stop it, you can turn it, you can move it. You can even have a little bit of control laterally back and forth with it as well. Um, there are some limitations with this. The uh, you know the limitations might be that the seas uh, you can't take the you we can't make the we can't secure the tug to the barge with wire because the two move independently. And if they did, it would rip they would either rip the tug up or rip the barge up or a little of both. So we do it with what we call soft lines, which are once again these big heavy nylon lines about like this, and deck on them. And it allows a little bit of stretch, so it flexes a little bit. And so what that means is that we can take we can take seas coming this way and hitting the barge much more than we can take them coming and hitting the tugboat. Because when they hit the barge, the barge will break it up before it comes to the intersection between the tug and the barge. But if you notice, there's something special about this picture. If you notice, this is the actual bow of the barge. And this is the actual stern of the barge. We call this the notch right here. And it's, we're pushing it backwards. You say, why do you do that? Well, we don't do that with loaded barges. When a barge isn't loaded and doesn't have product on it, we call that being a light barge. And um, the problem with, if we, if you took this tugboat right here and you moved it right over here, and so now, it was pointed in the same direction. The bow is only drawing about one foot of water when it's light, but the stern's drawn about four feet of water because of all the mechanical equipment back here. And then what you don't see is there's something called a rake, and that's where the, it's not a square end here. It comes up in an angle, and they do that for hydrodynamic reasons. But they also have these skegs. So there's one over here and one over here that stick down. They're kind of like keel extensions. And that allows it so when you're towing the barge, it will tow straight because you're towing, you know, the keel goes through the water. Well, if we did it the other way and we were headed the other way, if any bit of wind or anything got that bow, there wouldn't be any barge in the water to stop that bow from moving anywhere, you know, because it's only a foot in the water. When we make up to it backwards and we got four feet of stuff in the water back here, I don't care about the stern going anywhere because it's tied to me and I'm not going anywhere, so it's not going to move. But by pushing it backwards, getting those skips in the water, it bites in. Now, there's one other thing that I think is kind of interesting. You can say, I hope this 
doesn't doesn't sound too boring to you guys. But what you're seeing here is something that we call pinch. And if you notice the tug, see how it's really tight right here in the bow? And then if you look in the stern, see that big opening back there? And so it's really at an angle. And that angle we call pinch. And the reason why we do this is because if the two were made up parallel, remember that there's no propulsion in the barge. The barge is only experiencing drag. There's a uh, you know, the, it, it doesn't want to go anywhere, and the tug is only propulsion, it wants to go. So if you were made up perfectly flat, you know, they were made up parallel with them, the barge would always want to rotate to the right right now because because of the, the drag on that side. So the tugboat would have to put, would have to counter that with a lot of what we call left wheel. So in other words, you would have to steer really hard to the left just to go straight with this thing. And so... By doing that, the barge wants to pull to the right, the rudders won't pull to the left, and you go straight, but you lose almost half your speed because your all your energy is used up trying to fight these forces instead of moving forward. Now, the way we deal with that is by putting the pinch in, we essentially get this part right here, and where this was the from one side of, to the other side of the stern, which is the actual working bow now, that was flat. It was like perfectly in line with the tugboat. By giving it a pinch, it's angled. So now that this is the bow, and the water will come and drag this skeg and pull it to the left, just as the water comes on this side and pulls it to the right. And if you do it just right, you can put your rudders at zero degrees either way, and it tremendously increases your speed. And you get the out of benefit of that with when if you if you have to steer straight with hard left wheel, you can't turn left, you can only turn right. And so by getting your rudder in the midship, you'll be able to turn both ways. That makes sense? So that's heads and tails, what we call heads and tails. So in other words, that means that the tug is going one way and the barge is going the other. And we only do that, we don't have to do that with a loaded barge, because remember I was telling you that the, the bow, when it's only drawing one foot, they skate all around the water. Well. Um, when it's loaded, that's not an issue because now the bow is 20 feet in the water. So that's fine. Um, so um, the biggest advantage is that you have great controllability. You can usually get to a dock without even asking the help of an assist tug. And not only can you stop the barge and drive it forward, but you also have lateral control. You can actually move this thing sideways without a bow thruster. That's kind of really cool. But the next one, and one of my favorites, is push gear. And this is where you'll see a tug line up. See this one right here? It's lined up the back of a barge. This is a different tug, but the same idea. This is called the notch. And so the tugboat fits right in here, right into this notch. And it's held in place by these things right here. We call push wires. And I have to tell you, when I started in the industry, they really were wires. <laughs> but now they're a synthetic Dyneema line called the Amstel Blue. And uh, that they're the same size of the wire, and there's something like, like four times the breaking strength of the wires, so that, and they don't break people's people who had shoulder and back injuries trying to lift those up to put it get in place. But anyway, this is wonderful. We love push gear, and the reason why we like it is because now instead of worrying about how much pinch you have, whether you're going heads and tails or heads and hoods, whether you're worrying about how much rudder you have. You're basically just driving your same boat that you always drove it, but it's now instead of being 100 foot long, it might be 450 feet long. So you're just driving a bigger boat and it all acts as one, and we love that. Well, the problem is, is that we can only do this when the weather is just right. Uh, being that the barge has so much mass compared to the mass of the tugboat, the two of them move independently. Now, in in a real sense, the barge moves as well. But from the eye of the guy who's on the boat, it looks like the, the barge is static. It's not moving at all. And the tug is just move flopping around all the time because when a wave comes by, anything like that, we're going to move. They're not because they're, they're going to weigh, I mean, like I say, they can weigh 12, 15,000 tons, where I just might weigh two or 300 tons. So it's going to move quite a bit. So. That means we can only do this when we're in protected waters of like a harbor or going in, in a river, that sort of thing. If there's any sort of sea, it's very difficult. Or it's very easy to break this bush here. 
So uh, those are our limitations. Um, anything more than say two feet of sea behind us or alongside us will will be disastrous for us. Um, we could take a lot more if it comes in front of us because the you know if the if we're crashing into the waves, the barge will break the the wave for us. It won't be as bad. But that's a real problem. Oh, you know what? One thing I, I didn't tell you was that one of the biggest advantages is that because the two of them are made together, you're only pushing one, you're having two units, but you're pushing one unit through the water. In other words, the water that's broken up here in the bow rolls underneath the barge. Oh, I keep hitting that light back, so I'm sorry. Rolls underneath here like this all the way through, and it goes all the way back to the tug is one unit. And because of that, not having normally it would go like this and go up and hit the tug and then down again and you know go and hit the tug again and uh that would slow you down so you make your best possible speed this way so yeah and, and then i keep saying speed we're talking about you know half a knot so you make a half a knot better you say why is that better well at the end of the day we're doing this by people i mean these are 10 million dollar tubs and the reason why corporations have these things is to make money by moving stuff so if you know it sounds weird but if i can make one more move after working for a month and i move one more thing i might have made a payment for somebody you know so everything unfortunately everything is about time so the faster we can do things the better so the next thing and the last thing we're going to talk about this boring configuration stuff is the our atvs or articulated tugging barges and if you look it kind of looks like a big version of the tug in push gear, and that's exactly what it is. It's a giant version. I mean, they don't always have to be giant, but they can, they have the potential of being massive. Where my barge, my barge is, is uh, 400 feet long. And when we're made up in it, we can say it's like 450 or thereabouts. Um, we only hold 50,000 barrels of, of, of oil. Some of these barges hold 450,000 barrels of, of oil. So they're truly massive. And what they do is, if you notice, there are there is no push wires here. There's nothing here. None of those ships, Texas bar, none of that stuff's here. They don't even have a winch. What they've done is they've gone up to the bow, and in the barge, in the, in the notch in here, they made a series of big holes, you know, like receivers. And in the, in the bow of the ATB, they put these huge hydraulic ramps that are like almost three foot around. And they actually go and they, they, when they load the barge down, the tub will come into the place and they extend the rams out and they click into position. And now they're, they're a part of it. But there's only, it still articulates. So in other words, as the barge rolls from left to right, that it will bring the tug with it, roll it back and forth. Which that sounds like, oh, the poor people on the tug. No, the tug would roll a thousand times more than the barge will. So the barge is really slowing the tug down from rolling back and forth. But it doesn't, it's not made as a physical connection other than the pins. So, in other words, if a wave comes behind it or a wave comes in front of it, the bow, the stern will go up and the bow will go down, or the bow will go up and the stern will go down. So it articulates on those pins. And this has been something that they had been fooling around with probably 30 years ago and started coming into their own 20 years ago. And now they're really, really popular. Um, they're popular for not for any of the reasons I just told you about. It's going to blow your mind. Telling you an inside trade secret here. The real reason why is that owners, uh, you know, shipping companies have figured out a way around the shipping law. Remember that we on the tugboats sail with not the personnel that we'd like to have on board. We sail with the minimum the Coast Guard will allow us to have on board. And that's not because we want to, it's because the people that are paying the bills, the, the margins have gotten so small, they, 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 they cut every corner that they can. They're not running away with anything. It's just how business is done. You, see, you don't see the people checking out at the grocery store like you used to. You know, there's a lot of self-service stuff. Well, if you have even a 200,000 barrel barge ATV, um, that would be about the equivalent of a coastal tanker that we have 14, 16 people working on there that the Coast Guard mandates 
Or if it's a 450,000 barrel bar, it's there might be as many as 24 or 33 crew that the mandate that the, the, the Coast Guard or IMO, the International Maritime Organization, mandates that they have to have on legally have on board. And what that would mean, um, so let me tell you why these guys don't have to do that. Because at the end of the day, they can pull these pins back and the barge can separate from it. You get the ear or the tub can separate from the barge. The barge is still left. It has no power, it has no propulsion. It has, so because it doesn't have propulsion, it doesn't need a captain, it doesn't need a, a chief mate, a second mate, a third mate, it doesn't need a chief engineer, a first, second, and third engineer, it doesn't need any of those people. And then they, they don't need that. They, you know, once you have so many people, you need cooks, and you need all these other things. Well, so they can remove all those. So all those people will, will work on the, on the tug. And then when they get to port, then they all climb out of there and they all come out and they do all their things. And so that's the reason why you see a lot of ATVs, because even though we don't think that um, we ever get paid enough to do the job we do, the, the shipping companies see that the only thing they can do is stop you know, reduce the number of people to try to make, to try to become more and more competitive. And so that's what they've done. Mm -hmm. All right, so these guys can go, um, I have heard, this is actually my friends, my friend is the captain of this, and he uh, he tells me they have something like 20 foot or 24 foot sea restriction. So in other words, they can still be out there. Remember when I was in bush gear, I can only go out in two feet. He go out there in 24 feet. Now granted saying that, I don't think that he ever would because he'd be, he'd, he'd be a very bad captain. You shouldn't, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. But uh, they're wonderful. They make great speed. They're much more comfortable. And uh, that's how that works. How are we doing? Well, Everybody, anybody sleep yet? <laughs> All right, so one, uh, you know, something that has changed a lot in my time um, in tug boating is that um, almost all of us today have uh, internet access through satellite, whether it be uh, the old satellite constellations that we used to use. And now on my boat, we actually have, for the crew, we have uh, Starlink. And what we do is, you know, obviously it's nice to stay in touch with your loved ones, but it's mm. also nice to get um new information that we didn't have just a few years ago and this right here is an example of we can in real time see satellite imagery of exactly what's happening right at any given moment and uh um and it doesn't matter whether we don't it's not like we lose a cell signal we're getting it from the satellites we can be in the middle of the atlantic ocean and still get that all right so then we can also do the same thing you know you guys when you see the uh news You'll see all these, well, you know, the satellite imagery. But we do something that they usually don't show in the news that much. The rest of the day have these uh, wind months, and these are forecasting. This is not showing what happened. This is showing what's going to happen in the future. And basically, I don't know if you guys can see it over here, but this is the Gulf of Maine right here and the Cape Cod here and coming down through Havris and down to Florida. But this is, this is just a, something that I recorded the other day when I was putting this presentation together. But... Let me see if we can get it here. But you can see it shows the wind direction and then the colors. You come over here to the colors and you can figure out how much the wind is blowing. So, in other words, if you were right here and you're like, what am I going to do? You can say, well, at this time, the wind should lighten up before here. And then finally, we get here, we won't have any wind at all. So, you can, the forecasting has gotten much, much better. Um, if there still are definitely limitations, they'll give you a 10 day forecast. What I think has really changed is that. It seems like when I was much younger, a five day forecast was just a guess. Well, a 10 day forecast today is a guess. But for the, for the first for the first 72 hours, they're they're just about on money. And these these things will tell you at two o'clock, the wind is going to change and it changes at two o'clock. Not always, but much better than it used to. Now, we can also do this. We can take the same technology for you utilize from the satellites and predict weather of uh, wave uh, heights. So not only will it show us wave directions, but it will also show us how many, and you can do it in meters and feet or whatever you want, but this will actually show you how rough things are. And like, so sometimes it's important, you know, if you wait for the perfect weather window to go from here to Florida, you might not ever get it. 
But you might say to yourself, I'm going to have to go out. We'll get beat up for six hours. Then it will get better. 18 hours later, it's going to be great. And then after that, the weather will be behind us. And tools like this have really changed our industry for the better. So that's with that. And uh, then this is just some uh, some footage I wanted to show you. It, this I'm always amazed because <laughs> the camera never does anything justice. You know, the, 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 the biggest C's on cameras look totally flat. But one thing that you have to remember, see that bow? That's the bow of our tug. That's about 12 feet off the water. So every time we're putting that down there, you can see that. And this is not really rough. This is down in China. <laughs> Uh, last month in the Gulf of Mexico, and the Gulf of Mexico has these short, steep seas. And I want to show you this because you'll probably hear a lot of people, especially a lot of the guys, say, "Oh, I'm the commandant of my yacht club," <laughs> or these, oh, "I was in the, I did this or I did that." And that's fine. But when they start talking about, "I was in 40 foot seas," "I was in 20 foot seas," and all that sort of stuff, those of us that live and work yeah. out there all the time. We don't care how many feet the seas are. That means nothing to us. What really means a lot to us is what we call the period, and that's how many seconds it is between each wave. So, for example, right here, I think you're looking at like a six, six or seven second period, and that makes it really miserable. See that? There'd be one, there'd be one, two, three, four, there. So about four seconds. That makes it really miserable. And if you were, uh, I, I would I would rather be in twice the seas if I had twice the period. Does that make sense? Because now you're just going up a hill instead of crashing through it. Now this is the same day, but looking at the back. And um, I wanted to show you this because I thought that this would be interesting. Where a lot of boats don't want to have any water on the deck because most of our tugboat work is underwater. 15 feet of us is below the water. So, um, it's very common to have the deck wash. And now this is kind of giving you an idea. This is the Texas bar right here. And this is one donut here and the other donuts over here. And you can only use one at a time, but they give you two so that if, yeah. if one drops out, you can pick up the other one on the other side. But, but that's how that works. And um, then it's not all, it's not all rough seas and terrible weather. You know, most of us that are out here, we're not indentured servants. We, we choose this life and we end up having to be away from home for a minimum of 182 days a year. Many of us work over when the company asks me, hey, can you help out? I go work over. So what that means is we're away from our loved ones and our family for almost we're, the family we have as our crew becomes almost more where we see them more than we see our own family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's something that doesn't bode well with some people and they're not a good fit for this industry. And then, the, the, you know, people that say, oh, I don't like people or I don't like them. I, I feel very strong about this particular subject. They're probably not going to do well on a hundred foot island with four other guys <laughs> for three weeks at a time. You need to be, uh, and, and the other thing too is that we come from all walks of life, from every every spot uh, in the U.S. and sometimes around the world. Anyway, one thing that is universal is food, and, and I think that it's no mystery that the Navy has always said that they've had the best chow in all of the armed forces. Sometimes people argue with me uh, about having served. I couldn't, I can't say one way or the other, but I can tell you that. Food is probably the number one thing that we look forward to. <laughs> Since the days of the Exxon Valdez, we can't have any liquor on board or anything like that. And because of uh, the days of 9-11, we can't have any friends or family even come to visit us on the boat. And I would say, not even 9 out of 10, I'd say 19 out of 20 times, uh, 19 out of 20 of, of the places we go to load or discharge, they won't allow us off anyway because of security. So we are basically imprisoned for this time. And there's some people that can't deal with that. Um, you know, there are marriages that fail because, you know, uh, it, it, you know, I, I tell the mm -hmm. kids when they come to work for us and say, if you're in a relationship and you get a call at three in the morning, your wife says that the, a pipe broke down in the basement, you got to have a plan for that because you can't get off the boat. There's nothing you can do about that. And she's got to be good with that. If she's not good with that, then, uh, it's probably not going to be a good fit for you. 
But the universal thing is food. Food brings everyone together. And uh, in 1988, our industry lost our cooks. We used to, uh, there was a, in 1988, but there was a big strike and the unions got broken. Before that, we had professional cooks on board. And I can tell you that uh, I wasn't in the industry in 1988, so um, I don't know what it was like with the cooks. But what has happened is people that could only cook if something that came out of a can or out of the box now were forced to become cooks, and they did it on a company's dime. And I have worked with kids that were 20 years old who had never cooked anything, and they're like, yeah, sorry, Pam, I don't cook. I said, well, you know something? There's a lot of dogs that I don't like. I hate going to that dog for 20 years. I've gone into that dog and had a hard time every time I've gone there. I would love to tell my boss, I don't do that dog. But that's my job. And in this case, cooking dinner is your job. <laughs> and so, uh, so I've seen kids that couldn't cook anything years later become the most, the greatest gourmet chefs in the fleet. And, and, and it, it does more than just nourish the, the crew. It also, it binds us together. When you, and people, you know, anytime, you know, in the old sailing ships, they used to say that uh, painting was good for morale. Nobody likes painting, but it's work you do. You see it, you know, you, the boat gets beautiful. And then you, I think the same thing happens for somebody, especially the person that has to cook is usually the deckhand on, the mate's watch because he's making dinner for everybody while everyone else is sleeping. And uh, except me, obviously. But uh, <clears throat> that's usually the least senior man, like the, the newest guy there. Oh, so God. he's going to be there. And then he sits down. And when he hits it out of the park, he has a crew that is really grateful to him and really happy. And he feels good. And we call that earning his strength, and he's earned his strength. He's one of us, and it's wonderful. We have we have all kinds of food. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, so many of us play boat people have such food. <laughs> <laughs> but we eat very well, and um, here's luckily this scallops and meat. Oh, we're wonderful. <laughs> um, we my. My father often asked me, he knows I used to love to cook. And when when um, when when I started on tugboats, I started at the bottom and was the cook and I ended up staying there for a long time. And I often said that bad performance on deck was forgiven by good performance in the in the galley. So if you're gonna cook something well, they're gonna keep you around. But we make bread and here's some key lime pie. Oh. Um, here we're getting, getting some uh, roast beef ready. We also had fish whenever we get a chance, and now uh, we time permits we fish. This was I'm embarrassed to admit this. I was working over working over me, working on my off time, and uh, I was working over helping out on on this boat. And I've been in New York Harbor, and New York Harbor when I first started working there. You would never have to paint the bottoms of the boats because nothing grew on the boat because nothing was alive in there, and they've done so much work for the last 30 years or maybe longer for all I know but in the time that I've been seeing it that now if you don't paint the bottoms of your boat things do it and they have these I, I mean I've never ate anything that came out of New York Harbor having said that these guys this guy's an old Carolina boy and they were catching these to talk right off there and they look really healthy and they were great we also have people from all over the country and so a good Maine boy like me is to be exposed to food I've never eaten before and this is something called Ready for this? This is chicken fried steak. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, can't understand why so many of us are having heart attacks at 30. Oh, <laughs> no, no. Well, the southern people also cook fried chicken. But I can tell you that I've never had fried chicken so good as some of the guys that cook on the boat there. The Carolina guys are big for uh, barbecue, for you know pork barbecue. But I am always I like cooking the turkey at Thanksgiving or the roast beef at Christmas. Now here's just a this this was uh, me working over it at this last Thanksgiving, and uh, I worked over it. this. This was my friend. He's another captain, and uh, he and I have been friends for a long time. And his mate got promoted, and so he had an opening. And uh, I, I I said, oh, I'll come work with him. He's my buddy. So I came to work on his boat, and so it was really great. Now, in this particular time, we were supposed to take a barge down to Wilmington, uh, South South North Carolina, right? North, North, North. North. Yeah, one of the Kakalakis. <laughs> well, we were supposed to go down there, and the weather was bad, 
And so the captain made the call and said, no, nope, we're going to stay here. We're going to be anchored. We're going to have Thanksgiving dinner. And after that, we'll get underway. <laughs> and so it's nice. And, it, you know, I, I can't tell you how when the boat usually smells like diesel fuel and boat and all that, to have the boat smell like your home, like right. now your mom cooked it and have the Thanksgiving with all the fixings on it. We sit around, we watch the football game and, you know, you're not with your with your wife, you're not with your kids, you're not with your friends, but you are with your brothers, your brother barriers, you sit here, and these are the times that uh, really make it all worthwhile. That's that. Mm -hmm. So, do we, anybody can yeah, yeah, have a question over here? Probably a lot of the names, names, which is, uh-huh. And he, uh, he did that, but he can't leave, but he's up in the Rockwell area, down in the Southern Wing, but this kid, he, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a very small industry, and uh, I'm constantly amazed at the people I run into. Um, I, I, I don't know him per se, but he, we, we, our paths probably have crossed mm -hmm. the lines, and if not, then they will in the future. My, uh, my better half, my daughter, were up here uh, a couple weeks ago. We went down to Boston to see a show for a night. We were staying at the Boston Mariner House. And I went into one of the other little side thing. I went in there and there's some guy that I, that I, I've never worked with, but he's a fellow tugboat guy that I haven't seen. And it's funny how it's a very small world and everybody seems to know each other. Does anyone else have any idea? Um, how do you, <clears throat> you obviously eat well. <laughs> I, I love the profile. Who gets the food? Who orders that? How does that get on board? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, to kind of give a shameless plug for my YouTube channel, um, I have what they call patrons, and there's some people that pay $2 a month to, to encourage me to make more uh, videos. And this particular patron told me two years ago, she said, Hey, I'd really like to see what they call it. We call it grub shopping. You go grub shopping and you put up on the boat and it means you buy all the groceries. And I was like, okay. And I can't really say I don't want to do that because this is something that's supporting the channel. And no well, one's ever going to watch that. So two years goes by. Finally, I don't have any content. And my engineer and the deck hand are going to go shopping. We, we okay. rented a, uh, you know, we, we got a, you have to get a special, uh, taxi service that has what they call a twit car that is allowed to get onto the port, get through security to pick them up. Then they go off to like like um, Costco and I, the company gives the captain a credit card. He can go off and do anything. Ooh. And uh, so he just got my GoPro and just stuck it on the, the, the car and loaded about $2,100 worth of groceries, pushed it around. I made it into the worst video I've ever made ever. I put it out, and in like three days, and it's got like 168,000 views on it. So I was completely wrong about it. So if you are interested and you watch YouTube, I have a video that's very popular right now of that very thing. But what happens is that they give us an allotment, and it's about $25 per, and just, we just got raised up to $25, so about $25 per man per day. And then it goes, and we can spend it basically how we want. Um, so in other words, mm. in my in my time, I've seen it where we have never had enough money, and we've had to eat, you know, peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> uh, right now, we have more money than we need, and so things are really good. And and, and it, that's just you know, how things happen. And uh, you kind of have to deal with that. Um, there's other times that um, they'll go over, like if they have two thousand dollars to shop and. Bill might come in at $2,300. Um, there are some captains, it's up to the discretion of the captains, mm -hmm. captains will tell them to put the food back. But most of us, the captain will pay for that out of his pocket. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it, it's a small price to pay because, like I say, food and, and morale is so important. Mm -hmm. Remember, a 110 foot tugboat or steel mm -hmm. island is a very small place for five unhappy men. <laughs> so, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, did you do you ever have a situation where you have to go out and deal with a ship that may be in trouble, possibly sinking or something, sort of an emergency situation? 
Um, we we witness those audibly. In other words, we because we all have to monitor the radio, so we hear that on the radio a lot. And I've got to tell you, in my time, I've never had to do that. There's been a couple times that we've gone, and but before we've got there, somebody else has gotten to them. But that has not happened with me yet. But but it's something that we. Um, and you know, you bring up a good point that I probably should have put in the presentation. And that's that we are required. There's so many things like. The first 24 hours that we're on the boat, we have to do a fire and boat drill. And then, you know, every month we have to do a different one. And we all have to be, uh, you know, we all have to be certified not only in, in uh, CPR. I say that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, but we also have to be able to use the E. Yeah. 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 The, the defibrillator, we have those on board. Um, the, the officers, all of us have to be what they call a medical PIC. So we basically have to take a course where we get, they, they give us the no. pig's feet. We have to stitch the pig's feet up and that sort of thing. Oh, right. So there are stuff that we have to do. We have, we all have to, all of us have to have basic firefighting. The officers have to have advanced firefighting. Um, having said that, part of my fire drill, I tell people that uh, we are not firemen um, because boats are equipped with the bare minimum that hmm. the Coast Guard mandates. Every firefighting class I've ever been to says that we never enter any big ball structure alone. And all of our boats have Scott air packs and turnout gear for one person. Hmm. So because of that, say we will try to break down a fire with our portable handhelds, then we'll seal up and pull up CO2. And, you know, we've got insurance. We don't have insurance for our lives. And uh, hopefully that won't cost me my job, like boss ever hears that, but anyone who sails with me usually appreciates that. But we do have training all the time. And it's very common that if you want this as a your profession, you should count on at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, of different courses that time out every five years that you have to keep taking, you know, just like school teachers have to do continuing education or doctors and that sort of stuff. Anything else? Yes, sir. Quick question. Do you ever have to take a pilot out to get a job? Absolutely. And you know what? The company that I used to work in Connecticut, I did all the time. And when I was working for that company in Connecticut, I actually ran the pilot boat on my off time. And so, yeah, no, no, we, we, we do that a lot. Just having to have a pilot. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so there are two types of pilots that the U.S. uses, what we call federal pilots and state pilots. And it actually works exactly the opposite of what you would think it would work. Federal pilots only do what we call Jones Act ships or boats. And those are U.S. flagged with U.S. crews, U.S. built, U.S. financed, U.S. owned. Um, and so there, there are only 66 um, merchant ships, and most of those are with the Military Sea Lift Command. Almost all the other ships in the world are flagged at what they call ports of convenience. So they flag them to somewhere that they re they don't even have any ocean. They, they just do it so that they have light labor laws and stuff like that. But uh, so when a ship of another nationality comes into, into our waters, they can't come in past a certain area until they have a pilot on board. And this is about 10,000 tons or greater, which is basically almost every big ship out there. Um, and so, so a foreign ship will come in. And I don't know if you guys know this, but um, air, oh, I have to say airline pilots. Almost all of the regulations and almost all the things that we do in our line of work actually comes down from the airline industry. The airline industry comes up with really good ideas, and then after they've been in place for a while, they've worked, then we adopt them in, in our, and, um, you know, um, when, when you bring, when a foreign ship, regardless of its nationality, the officers have to be able to speak English. English is the merit is the maritime language, and it's mm -hmm. every if you have two Lufthansa pilots in Germany and they're flying to German places, they're speaking to the controllers and themselves in English. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have foreign ports, and that's that's a real problem because people's <clears throat> definition or their fluency is varies <laughs> all over the world. But so they'll come in, and a pilot will come with what they call local knowledge. The, the master of the vessel is still ultimately responsible, but but do you want to take the pilot? That you pay big money for, you know, it's 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 like your buddy who hired a lawyer 
and then do what the lawyer told them to do. But if you're, if you're going to pay for a pilot, you should use what their advice is. So that's what it is. Now that's that's the foreign side. They they do the state pilots. The federal guys do the stuff that are all the U.S. boats, and that also includes me. So. If you were moving non hazardous cargo and you're under 10,000 tons, like, like I was moving stone or scrap steel or sugar or something like that, um, I don't, I don't need pilotage. I don't need, need, need anything. Well, because it's very well, and it's just like a trailer truck going from Maine to New Jersey. It's not a big deal. Um, but if you're moving hazardous material, we need what we call recency, and it's a form of pilotage where I need 12 trips in and out of every place I go. And I think three in the last five years, and so many at night. And, and and if I don't have that, I have to hire a federal pilot. A federal pilot will take me. And what's nice about a federal or state pilot will only operate in the state waters. The federal pilot will be able to do all the waters he's he's sat for. And when they when the pilots sit for a test, they actually draw the chart. So it <laughs> didn't know by heart. But anything else? Go, cool. Louisa. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Like I said, I have a brand new video that's just out. It's performing terribly right now <laughs> compared to the other ones. But uh, it's funny. My YouTube channel, all the videos I love, nobody likes. All the videos I don't have, everyone likes. But anyway, so um, yeah, I stayed in the Boston Mariner House. And the Boston Mariner, and I've stayed there a bunch of times, but it's something that's really cool that you don't see that often. Years ago, uh, the sailing ships around the world would have different places that they could go where their families could go and wait for them to come in because they didn't have the communications we have now. They don't know when they're coming in. And so um, in the U.S., we had these mariner houses all up and down the east and west coast mm -hmm. and uh, Gulf Coast, too. And uh, so in other words, my wife and kids might know that I'm going to be in Portland Harbor on or about this date. Yeah. So they might come three or four days before, but they couldn't because, you know, I'm just a regular seaman. They couldn't afford to stay in a place like downtown Boston or something like that in case of the Baron House. Um, so they'd have to stay far away. But when you think about it, these ports were made because of the work that the people like us did, and we can't even stay there. So some people put some money together, this was back in the 1800s, and they actually bought these houses where mariners don't stay there for free, they pay for the, 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 but I mean, in the case of the Mariner's House um, in Boston, it's in the north end, probably the fanciest, nicest part of all of Boston. I think the equivalent room would probably be around $400, $450 a night. And the Mariner's House is $69 a night for uh, oh, no. non-officers, I think uh, $89 or something like that for officers. And uh, it's a it's beautiful. It was uh, the Boston uh, Mariner House was founded in 1841, I think. And as far as I know, it's the last one that's going on the East Coast. I thought it was the last one anywhere, but since I put this video up, people have told me that there's a couple, there's one in Hawaii that's still operating. There's a couple in California, but they've gone private. You know, they used to be Mariner House, and now they're open to the public. But you can't go there unless you have uh, proof of sea service in the media, merchant mariner credentials, and that sort of thing. But it's something that I think is a uh, Really, inter really neat. And when you when you go to the, I mean, if, if you guys have a desire to look at my silly videos, you're more than welcome to. But I show the inside, and it really looks almost like a museum. It's like the classiest, really well done, but definitely from another year, era. You know what I mean? And, and uh, it's what, and they have a galley set up, and an old a guy that used to cook. You know, a a, um, a merchant ship chef runs their galley and provides all the foods for and you come down the line just like you would in a ship. It's really, really neat. Anybody else? Uh, I saw that the tug had a name. Is that Moran? Um, yeah, that though that that's that was Moran. That was the Barney Terracoma, which is a Moran boat, if you are correct. They only are they only in New York Harbor. No, no, they're they're all over. They're all over. Yeah, yeah. They they there's an interesting story about uh, Moran and that's that Apparently, they were just a New York company. Right. And then World War II happened, and they went and they made mm -hmm. Grampy Moran or whoever it was, they made him an honorary admiral. And he was in charge of 
doing all the salvage, going out to getting all the Liberty ships and bringing them back in. They got shot up and didn't sink. And I, that, that's a story I've heard. I haven't, I, that's only dog talk, but that, that's the story I heard. And that's how they, they, they did it. And Moran is not the company I work for, but they're a very well respected company and uh, they have great equipment. But, oh, there's somebody else. I think we do it. We have a marinara. Oh, really? Is it Siemens Church? Yeah, but it's not operating anymore. Right, right, right. Exactly. And, and and the Siemens Church is a different organization that um is is a wonderful organization, and they do great stuff. But it's really more faith based, mm -hmm. where the mariner houses didn't care. Uh, they just wanted to take care of the mariner. They didn't ask what faith you were. And um, I think the Siemens Church doesn't allow your wife or girlfriend or anything like that to stay there. It's just mm -hmm. for the men only and that sort of thing. But not to talk bad about the Seaman Church is great. So, your mission, should you care to excel? Hey, but I, I, I have these. Well, at least I think I love cards. Yeah, well, at, at, at any rate, I will, uh, if anybody's interested, I'll run up to the room real quick and get grab these cards. But if you're interested in seeing my YouTube channel, I'd love for you guys to uh, check out uh, Tim BNC. Or if you want to see the other one, here's uh, just a little short thing about this is uh, my other my sailing channel, um, SB Makita. And a couple of years ago, we kept the boat down in Puerto Rico for the winter, and then we sail it back up here to New England during hurricane season. And the last winter, we were down in uh, the Bahamas. This right here is more than wells in the Bahamas. And um, then uh, this year, we have the boat out of water just because I'm getting it ready. I'm preparing for what we call a refit, so I'll get you ready for the big trip, hopefully across the, the Azores and then over to uh, Gibraltar and the Mediterranean. But if that's something that you guys would like to see, stick around for a second and I'll give you a card for all that. But thank you guys so much for watching. I really thank appreciate you. it. You guys are a great crowd. I'm really happy to you. Uh, thank, thank you. Big turn. Thank you.